we do things and, and why we do things. And, and um, be interesting to compare them against, you know, other centres and other institutions to see, you know, because we're all aiming, obviously, for the best performing models that work well across all spatial and, and, and time scales. But there are many ways of approaching this problem to get to that same end result. And I should thank many people. I mean, a cast of thousands is perhaps an exaggeration, <coughs> but there's certainly many, many people involved in, in all of this. And, and my role in the Met Office mainly is to kind of lead this, <coughs> this RA regional atmosphere process in terms of model <coughs> development, um, evaluation, and assessment. So, I mean, obviously, we, you know, there's perhaps no need to over over elaborate on why we do convection permitting modeling. Um, obviously, um, we do it for numerical weather prediction, um, short range NWP, we do it for climate. Um, you know, the next generation of global modeling may well be um, convection permitting in the decades to come. So we're, the kinds of problems that we're hitting now and, and you know, investigating will be of use to the, to the global modeling community in, in the years to come. Uh, we obviously use convection permitting modeling also in, in coupled models. We have, you know, UK, UK coupled uh, model demonstrator, and uh, it has many other many other uses. Um, with the specific focus on climate, I mean, I, I, I guess you know I'm I'm preaching to a to a, to an audience here far more knowledgeable on, on on climate than I am, since I have a background more in in NWP. Uh, but certainly, you know, providing providing you have the the sufficient computing resources, then then you can use the the kilometer scale um, convection permitting models to to you know, achieve several goals in terms of reviewing the extent to which currently available regional climate projections from coarser resolution models are re reliable and or, and or robust uh, for use in policy making decisions, uh, to deliver new guidance and driving data for regional impact modeling, and to inform physical parameterization development in, in the coarser resolution models in which convection is parameterized. And certainly, you know, even if we, we don't concentrate on, on daily mean precipitation, you certainly see, and we've seen very much so far in these days, you know, improved performance over the global models in terms of sub-daily rainfall characteristics, uh, better representation of diurnal cycle of convection, spatial structure of precipitation, uh, duration intensity, this sort of thing. Um, so everything is based on the underlying code base of the unified model. Um, so this is a flexible code base. Uh, it has releases more or less once every three months or so. Uh, it's developed with, with continual uh, changes to the code, uh, all sorts of overnight tests on, on, um, on example model configurations to make sure that the code, new code changes don't break existing configurations. Um, and this, this, this unified model code base is used for both the globally, global model applications as well as the convection permitting ones. And so this allows a sort of seamless approach um, but as I say, the, the seamless approach doesn't mean that we use identical model configurations for all applications, but it does mean that there's a sort of deliberate and traceable set of differences that are made um, to any particular model to, to, you know, to fit to the application. Um, so yeah, we have you know, obviously many, many different applications. We run global modeling, we run ensembles, we run seasonal prediction, we run, sh run short range NWP. Uh, we, we run a model over London at 300 meter resolution. So um, what we have is, is we have all of this and everything which is kind of 10 kilometers or 10 kilometer grid spacing or coarser is, is kind of the model science is developed uh, in terms of the global, global atmosphere, global land, global ocean, global sea ice, this kind of um, set of, of processes. And then everything which is, we then don't tend to run anything in the kind of five to 10 kilometer range of the grey zone, and then everything which is convection permitting, we then have another kind of uh, set of science development working towards that goal. So one of the, one of the reasons for, for starting this whole art regional atmosphere process is, is, trying, is trying to tackle the issue of the number of scientific configurations. So when we first set up um, a model for NWP over the, over the UK um, at convection permitting scale, it, 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 it certainly you know, provided benefit over the course of resolution models, like the 12 kilometer regional model we were running at the time. Um, and so somehow it was tuned to work well over the UK. And then a few years ago, about five years ago, there was a collaborative project with Met Service of Singapore to develop a kind of cutting edge convection permitting um, NWP system for Singapore. And we simply transplanted 
the model from the UK to Singapore. And although the, the physics, uh, the laws of physics are the same, the meteorological conditions are very different and it performed very poorly. So we ended up tuning this model to try and get it to have better performance. And then, of course, for the last decade, we've been running models over uh, as part of the hazardous weather test bed in Oklahoma, where you have MCSs dominating and all, all sorts of other kind of, you know, convection and different weather, which is different to the UK and different to Singapore. So you could imagine that you could end up then tuning a model for there. And you could end up then with these multiplying mushrooms of different models over different parts of the world, each of them being tuned for a particular thing. Now, it should be said, you know, unlike kind of the community with WARF, where you have multiple parameterizations, we tend to focus on having just one parameterization, if possible, and tuning it to have the best performance working well everywhere. Uh, but this is then obviously quite a challenge when you have you know, so many parts <coughs> of the world with, with different meteorology. So, so part of the rationale for this, whole, for this whole process is, well, how do we go about trying to do effective model development in this, in this kind of setup? Um, so, yeah, just to emphasize you know, the, the number of different areas of the world, it's also true that we have this partnership, this collabor collaboration <coughs> with a number of MET services around the world. And this is part of our strategy of increasing, you know, sharing the load a little bit and having an uh, extra number of scientists on board looking at the same problem, evaluating the model over different parts of the world with different meteorology and, and contributing to the model development and assessment. <coughs> And uh, this is a slide that I think Roy may have seen uh, when he was in the UK for the Mosaic meeting uh, last time, which, in which the plethora of domains just over the tropics is, is, is clear to see. And as I say, you know, in, in Singapore, you may be concerned with, with, um, with Sumatran squalls. But if you then move the model over Philippines, well, you're worried about, about you know, tropical cyclones. And it's not clear that you could get away, you know, you, you could easily end up with specific models over specific regions of the world tuned for specific meteorological uh, phenomena. So as I say, this is, this is why we have this regional atmosphere. Um, it's, uh, it's just a relatively new process. We're just in the process now of releasing RA1, which is the first version of, 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 of the RA. So I'll kind of just spend a few moments kind of going over this slide, because this kind of is the kind of crux of how, how the, the, the model development and assessment works within the, within the regional atmosphere process. So mm -hmm. we have a kind of model development research cycle, this, this box <coughs> on the left here. And this is where um, code developers, whether they're, whether they're developing a new dynamic core or just you know, improvements to parameterizations, they're working on, on their particular change. And this process stipulates that they must have good documentation, their code should be reviewed, the code should be you know, included in the latest version of, 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 of the trunk or the rest of it. And they know at what point there's going to be a decision-making meeting. Is their code change mature enough to be gone to the next level of testing that can perhaps become operational? Um, so we then have a, an implementation cycle or annual release cycle in which we, we review and we, we, we kind of work out which pieces of science are mature enough to, to, to become potentially operational. And we, we, we then have a hierarchy of testing from case studies through to data assimilation trials, running in climate mode to, to, to work out whether a whole series of um, changes work well on their own and they do what the code developer wants them to do. But also when you then put these changes together as a package, do they work well together as a package? Um, and then once, once this is done, we, we more or less release with hopefully documentation then which is written out about the characteristics of the model, what this new release has in terms of changed characteristics in terms of systematic biases and things. Uh, and then that's kind of ready <coughs> for an operational um, use or, or kind of operational climate service use, for example. Uh, so as I say, currently we're on, our, on RA1, the very first version of this. And we're also working now on RA2, which is, which is the second version. So I say the box on the right is this kind of operational use. Um, the box down at the bottom is, is on the kind of evaluation <coughs> verification side. So of course, on the NWP side, the forecasters are looking at the model every day and providing feedback, uh, often not mincing their words in terms of how they think the performance of the model is. Um, we have what we call P PEGs, process evaluation groups, where we have particular phenomena whether it be US continental warm bias, southern ocean cloud bias, whatever it is, you have um, you have particular problems where you think that you need m many people from 
uh, perhaps with different, different skills, brought together to work on a specific problem and to try and come up with, a, with an improvement to the, to the model on this. Uh, we also then have, um, you know, when you, when, you do the, um, when you do this implementation, you, you, you perform lots of verification. Verification, both subjective, objective verification. Uh, and obviously you have the objective and subjective verification of the operational models as well. So, so all of this information is very, very useful. And this feeds back then into the model development cycle here, where you say, well, actually, what about where should we, where should we put our resources? What are the biggest efficiencies of the model? Where should we concentrate our research efforts? And this kind of feeds back into all of this. Um, so although our long-term aspiration is to develop a single version of the model, a uh, single convection permitting version of the model that will work well everywhere. As I've already mentioned, you know, the, 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 the difficulties we found, for example, trying to forecast over Singapore compared to the UK, means that we currently have two versions. We have a mid-latitude version and a tropical version. Um, but very much the, the, what this does, although we acknowledge that we, it, we're not in this kind of perfect world yet, we, we're trying to focus our research efforts on unif unification to, um, to have just one one version of the convection permitting science that works well everywhere. Um, so yeah, this is a this is a slide showing kind of this RA one um, and this kind of Venn diagram. And so the, the majority of the science, you know, 99 percent of the science is common between um, between the mid latitude and the and the <coughs> tropical versions, uh, but. On the left and on, on the left and on the right, you, you, we, we pick out here the key differences between them. So we actually have two cloud schemes: a diagnostic cloud scheme, the Smith cloud scheme, which is used uh, in the mid latitudes, and a prognostic prognostic cloud, prognostic condensate PC2 cloud scheme, which is used both in the global global um, models and also in the tropics. Now, the reason it's not been able to be used in the mid latitudes is that it really, really doesn't do a good job with with stratocumulus and we get lots of stratocumulus in, in the UK, and it, if the stratocumulus just ends up being broken up unrealistically, that's unacceptable. So we're working hard on trying to get the PC2 cloud scheme to work well in the mid latitudes because that's the scheme which is being actively developed. The Smith scheme has been more or less dormant now for a decade, so we want to be able to just retire that if possible. Um, I've heard uh, before um, comments about the importance of boundary layer mixing. I'm looking at Alan here. Um, to the representation of stratocumulus and showers. And certainly we've played a lot with boundary layer mixing details to try and get both a good stratocumulus forecast and a good shower forecast. And it's proved almost impossible with, with what we have at the moment to try and satisfy all of these demands. Uh, and what we find is that in terms of convection initiation, we tend to initiate a little, convection a little bit too late over the UK but we initiate too early in the tropics. So why is that? So this is one of these areas of work. I mentioned these process evaluation groups. We have a convection um, process evaluation group for the convective scale, in which we have people from all of our collaborating countries. And we've got five or six themes within that convection working group, looking at diurnal cycle, looking at triggering, all sorts of things, uh, trying to see if we can get a better understanding of the model uh, and, and what sort of um, model development changes we can, we can pull through. Um, so one of the changes that we've seen in RA1, which has uh, been quite pleasing, is an improvement to the diamond cycle of temperature. Um, previously, we were with the operational model. Uh, we were too cold uh, during the day, too warm by night. Sure, um, this is something that, which has improved significantly uh, with what with RA1. Um, also, something which we saw was that we we tend to make the kind of screen temperature a little bit more variable and. Uh, we were hit by this because we were looking at the root mean square error score to begin with, and this extra variability was, was leading on occasions to increased RMS error, which uh, is usually something that you worry about. But in fact, what, what we were finding was that there was an increase in variability, which was a skillful, realistic increase in variability, as seen here by uh, looking at ensemble results from the MOGREP GK 2.2 kilometre um, sort of NWP ensemble system. Um, we do still have differences between climate and NWP. Now, some of these are because of <laughs> George is laughing. Some of these are because of requirements, for example, in climate where you require a more 
um, intelligent, should we say, aerosol representation than in NWP. And we certainly have a zoo of different aerosol schemes in the Met Office to be able to choose from. And this is another major strategic area for us, is to try and rationalize this zoo of aerosol schemes into something much more manageable and, and, and logical. Uh, but for the moment, there are differences there. There are also differences to the field, such as um, kind of soil properties and things, the sort of things where in NWP, when you have a soil moisture analysis, the model's never going to be able to drift too far from a kind of truthful state, whereas in, in climate, of course, this is, this is not the case. And so you can get away with settings in NWP that you can't get away with in climate. So we have at the moment settings as they are, which have been recommended by the experts, but it may well be that for the sake of unification, you slightly detriment the NWP one because you know that you'll always have an analysis to correct it, uh, which will then give you know, superior the same setups then for, for climate and allow a more unified approach to things. Um, the assessment sure is really, really important. And one of the things that we've done um, across the partnership, the collaborative partnership, is to is to develop a set of software tools, kind of Python programs, uh, so that we're able to run the same sets of experiments, whether it's in New Zealand or Australia or the UK, using the same kind of. We know that we're using a traceable same set of setups. We're able to kind of evaluate the model using using kind of shared tools. So a lot of work has gone has gone into the kind of tools side of things, the suites side of things. Um, so yeah, we have you know all sorts of diagnostics for, for looking at properties of convection, uh, of course the objective verification, fraction skill scores, um, kind of these kind of scores here which um, with green triangles and purple triangles telling you about the performance of particular variables, um, whether it be cloud or, 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 or temperature or whatever, and whether, you're, whether your changes are, are making things better or worse. Um, so this is a really important part to what we do. I know that um, I'm running out of time, so I should probably um, look to, to, to finish up soon. So as I say, we're, we're, we're looking to, to unify the, the wind latitude and tropical versions. We're also looking to, to um, as I say, to, to move to this PC2 cloud scheme. And um, we've, we've certainly made progress in the last year on this. And uh, although these are very different cloud schemes, what we've found actually is that uh, there seems to be a really huge sensitivity to the point in the model time step in which you uh, put the particular adiabatic um, heating terms. And so in a, in a way this is good news because what it might mean is that although you've got two quite structurally different cloud schemes, the reason for the difference isn't necessarily all of this structure and detail, it's, it's a specific issue which if we can understand this and, and work on this means that possibly in the next couple of years, in RA3, for example, we may be able to have this unification of cloud schemes, which I think would make Georgia very happy. So, anyway. um, so RA2 is what we're working on at the moment. Uh, we're at the stage of doing individual, um, testing individual changes and then starting to package them up uh, and do trials and, and ending up with assessment reports and, and this kind of thing. And one of the, one of the things that's in this is, is the fact that we have a different vertical level set currently between the mid-latitudes and the tropics. So, when we were developing the Singapore model, we found there was insufficient, um, so we have a 40 kilometer lid, we found there was insufficient model resolution higher up in the troposphere uh, where the convection is, is obviously active. Uh, the UK, where we're interested also in fog and this kind of thing, we have a greater boundary layer resolution. So we have this 70 level set and 80 level set, which then means if you're running a convection permitting simulation, which covers both mid latitudes and tropics, well, which do you choose? Uh, and it's an unnecessary difference. So it's, that's one that we're looking to knock out in the next year um, by coming up with a level set which preserves the best, the best of the mid latitude resolution down in the boundary layer and the best of the tropical one in the upper troposphere. So, um, yeah, I, I guess another thing which I'll have about one minute to talk about is, is whether we should indeed have a parameterized scale away convection scheme. As I say, we've played long and hard with the existing knobs and understanding of, of, of the model systematic errors to try and get you know, the right diagonal cycle of convection, the right distribution of cell sizes, the right vertical velocities in the updrafts, all the rest of it. It's proving impossible at the moment. And so there, are, there is work going on on making the kind of current parameterized convection scheme scale aware. Uh, I wouldn't expect that it will solve all of our problems, but it may mean that in the future we reintroduce a convection parameterization which is truly scale aware, in which for a lot of things it doesn't do much work. But particularly when you're, for example, initiating convection, you have very small cumulus which is going on. This is happening at a scale which is you know, still <laughs> tens of meters. It's far below the, 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 the resolution that we have at one kilometer grid length that we're able to explicitly represent this. So you probably need some kind of parameterization to kick the convection initiation off. So 
we'll see. Hopefully, if I'm invited and can attend in these future meetings in the next couple of years, we'll see see how that progress is going and see how this RA process is going and whether this is a fruitful way of working or not. So I think I'll finish there. So.